Scroll. We're in chapter 9, and we saw last week how the people had turned and demanded a king. They made, they made a request to turn from the Lord and to ask for a king. And now about a decade or so has passed and no king has come on the scene. And, you know, it's kind of a curious thing. In, in, in many countries, people really lust for the position of power. And here, no Jew really stepped forward to take that position. So the Lord now is going to answer the request of these people. And he's going to have to work by providence to make this come to pass because he understands deep inside these folks, they, they, they don't particularly want to serve him in the manner he would like them to on an individual basis. They want someone to do the battles for them. So he's going to give them a taste of what it's going to be like. If you did not get last week's lesson, you might want to get a copy of that because the Lord paints a portrait, <laughs> a very... Uh, particular portrait that has held true over all the centuries of mankind as to what leaders will do to their people when given enough chance. And those seven characteristics of leaders are laid out in that chapter. But uh, here we're going to see the Lord continue to move because he has a purpose and a plan and eventually to put his son on the throne. But in the meantime, he wants to show us the difference, what happens when we let someone else on the throne. So in this chapter, he's going to allow the prophet Samuel to meet the new king, which is going to be Saul. And it starts out uh, in verse 1 telling, Now there was a man of Benjamin, whose name was Kish. He was the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bechorath, the son of Aphiah. He was a Benjamite, a mighty man of power, and he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a, a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. And the, the chapter is going to just lay some framework for us, showing us that this uh, tribe that God's going to work with is Benjamin. Benjamin is the smallest tribe in Israel. Benjamin had been in a lot of trouble back in the book of Judges, if you remember correctly. There was a terrible event that happened toward the final chapters of the book of Judges. And we're kind of ending the period of the Judges and the prophets doing what they can. But in that uh, final chapters of uh, Judges, there was a Levite that was uh, traveling home with his concubine and uh, some wicked men of uh, the area there in Benjamin, Gibeah, and the men, the Benjamites and the Gibeonites and the Sodomites, they, they killed his concubine. And there was a big uh, battle between the Jews and the small tribe of Benjamin, and they wiped all of them out, but for 600. And uh, what had happened is, uh, then lady, as they settled the land, and you go back in the book of Numbers, and you can take a look at the counts in the book of Numbers, I think it's 25, how many thousands heads of household there were for each tribe, but Benjamin only had 600 left. And they had a good parcel of land with 600 people. And so each man in Benjamin had a huge estate, kind of like a mini Ponderosa. They were kind of a wealthy tribe just because of what had happened to them, and they had a lot of land. And this man here, this uh, son of this Kish, uh, the Benjamite, was a mighty man of uh, power in the uh, marginal reading in the 1611. It says a mighty man of substance. The, the substance he had uh, gave him wealth and, and gave him some uh, local power in the vicinity there. But, but he's not a bad man. He lives in the city of Gibeah, and he's uh, busy about his business, and he's raising his boys right, and he's got a boy named Saul. And in these next uh, number of verses here, uh, we're going to learn a lot of characteristics about this boy Saul. And, and actually, there are 11 good characteristics you're going to see in this young man. Um, number one, we saw he comes from a good family, a prominent family. That's a good thing. Uh, I imagine if you get to pick your birth, if you had an opportunity ahead of time, and the Lord's up there in heaven saying, look, I'm going to take your spirit and I'm going to put it down there. Uh, where would you like to be born? I got a nice little place in a, in a wooded hut out there in Haiti uh, with no running water and a dirt poor family. Or I've got a nice uh, place in one of the suburbs in Malibu over there with a family worth a couple of million. You can pick where you'd like. I've got a place over there 
uh, in Texas got a good range of about 700 acres. And you got to pick, you might like to pick from a prominent family. Well, this boy's got a prominent family in his background. We learn in verse 2 that he's uh, good looking. We learn that he's tall. We see in the verse 3, the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So, so some of his uh, cattle had uh, run away and... Um, and uh, Kish said to his son Saul, Okay, take now one of the servants with thee. Arise, uh, go seek the asses. And, uh, and so there's a problem in the family. And uh, what does he do? Verse 4, he passes through the Mount Ephraim and passes through the land of Shalisha. And he's looking for the asses. He's an obedient boy. He's, uh, and practically, obedience is a good thing. A children should be willing to serve in their parents' interest. And this boy was, and that's a good thing. He's uh, number four. He's obedient. Another thing we see, verse, uh, he, he passed through the Mount Ephraim. Now, Ephraim was a nearby tribe bordering on Benjamin. So he not only looked in the region where he lived, he went the extra mile and crossed over the border. He's diligent. He's persistent got a lot of good qualities to this young man here. And God did not just pick some reject to put on the throne. Picked a kid from a prominent family that didn't have to worry about where am I going to pay my next bill. He was well financed. A kid that had good looks so he wasn't picked on his whole life and had an inferiority complex. A kid that was taller than the average ones. Muscular, well built. He was athletic. Picked someone that was a good son to a father. Was obedient. Was diligent. Was a persistent Verse 4, he passed through Mount Ephraim. He passed through the land of Shalisha. But he, and he's with the servant, he found them not. Then they passed through the land of Shalem, and they were not. Then he passed through the land of the Benjamites, doubled back on his tracks, but they found them not. Then they came to the next border. When they were come to the land of Zuf, about to go into the next region there, which would have taken them over by the Danites and, and the Judeans in the northern part of Judah, then Saul says to a servant that was with him, Come, let us return, lest my father uh, leave caring for the asses and take thought for us. He's considerate. He may have known something about the history, the stories of what happened to Jacob and his son Joseph. And how that troubled Jacob so much that his son had been sent out to seek for the boys out in the land of Shechem. And when he got there, they passed on to Dothan and he went on. And the next thing he knows, uh, his boy is lost. And it troubled Jacob to the end of his life. And he thought, you know, I mean, I'm working hard and we've been doing a good job. And a couple of days have passed. And sooner or later, my father's going to sit back and he's going to think, okay, I've lost a couple asses. And they're worth something to me, a couple of donkeys. But boy, my son and my servant are worth more than that. And I don't want him to be worried about me and worried about you. Let's go back and let him know how things are going. He's a considerate boy. I mean, he's obedient. He's diligent. He's persistent. He's considerate. So these are good things. Well, verse 6, I mean, so the servant are there. They're standing at the border trying to figure what's our next move. And, uh, and he said unto him, the servant turns back and says unto Saul, he says, hey, behold, uh, now, uh, there's in this city a man of God. And he is an honorable man. All that he saith surely cometh to pass. Now let us go thither. Peradventure, he can show us our way that we should go. So the servant uh, thinks about this situation and says, well, we're at the end of our rope and, and we, our wits have come to an end here. We don't know what we're doing and I'm just a lowly servant and although you're the son of my master, you're still young and uh, we, we don't know which way to turn. But, you know, there's a man of God and the man of God will have some wisdom. By the way, that's good. Have you figured that out? Are you, are you, do you understand the concept that God gives his men wisdom that serve him? That's one of the requirements. He doesn't exactly choose a man to serve him if the man doesn't have some inherent wisdom. After all, this is a very important business that he's about. And the Lord's very concerned about how his business is presented down here and how his son's gospel is presented. So, so there's a man of God. This, this man is an honorable man. And a man of God should be an honorable man. And if you find a man of God that's not honorable, you've got to wonder so much how much a man of God he is. But this servant knew 
He knew about Samuel. It had said a few chapters back that, you know, as Samuel ran his circuit, it said all Israel knew that he was a prophet of God. God let none of his words fall to the ground. I mean, all that he saith surely come to pass, it says right there in that sixth verse. In other words, he, this man of God was sticking to the Word of God. And when you stick to the Word of God, the prophecies of the Word of God are 100% accurate. And this servant had heard about this man and knew this is a good man. And if we're looking for a place to go, maybe it's time now for us to seek some help. We can't conquer this problem on our own. Good, good advice. I mean, the, the, a man of wisdom is like deep waters in a well. And what you want to do sometimes, you've got to come and ask. And, 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 and so the servant says, why don't we try this? So, so now here's uh, Saul. And actually, although this is uh, the servant of the father and may have been older than Saul, Saul, of course, is the son of the father. And uh, he's the inheritor. And uh, he has the final say. And he could have said, you know, don't tell me what to do. You're just a dumb servant. And I don't need advice from you. After all, look who I am. But instead... Uh, verse 7, Saul says to the servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there's not a present to bring to the man of God. What have we? Now here, he's respectful. He's respectful that this man of God is worthy of something. And, and he's duty-bound to bring him something, because that's the proper duty, is to bring something to the man of God. And he understands that. And uh, he's willing to condescend to come down to the level of the servant and say, you know, just because I'm the heir of all things and you're just a servant, that doesn't mean God didn't give you a mind and you may be able to see something I can't see. And so let me listen. Jack Hiles used to have a saying that all men are my teacher. And what he meant was this is anytime he met somebody, he figured that guy probably knows something I don't. If I listen long enough, I'll learn something from him. It's good. You never know what God will bring out of someone else's mouth if you just shut yours in for a moment and open your ears. So, so I, li I like there's a lot of good characteristics here. I mean, duty-bound, number eight. Respectful, number nine. Willing to condescend. Teachable, 10 and 11. I mean, these are all good things. Well, the servant says, okay, uh, verse eight. Uh, uh, he answers Saul says, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. That will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. And... Uh, the servant had something, and Saul thought it over, and seems reasonable, and you're going to see, verse 10, then Saul said to his servant, well said, come, let us go. And so they went unto the city where the man of God was. Eleven good outer characteristics that could be observed by any bystander or any man. You know, the man looketh on the outward appearance. Man looketh on the outward appearance. I mean, this kid is what we call from central casting. I mean, if you're looking for someone to be a leader, good looking, that, that, that goes over real well. Tall, the average president was taller than the average American. What was the guy that told us that? What, Lincoln, what was his name? Lincoln Goodhart, Lincoln Goodhart, and that's true. And, 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 and these are some interesting things that come from a prominent family. So he's had the opportunity to be well-educated. But he was obedient. He wasn't some rebel, some do-nothing from a prominent family. I mean, this kid's obedient, diligent, persistent. He's considerate. He's respectful. He's duty-bound. He's willing to condescend and listen to others. And he's teachable. These are good characteristics. By the way, I, we skipped over verse 9 for a second, one of those curious parenthetical verses that the Lord every so often puts in his scriptures. And he, he just says this, uh, before time in Israel, when a man uh, went to inquire of God, thus he spake, he would say, come, let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. 
And here is the Lord just showing you, teaching you, saying, please pay attention. Pay attention that I inhabit eternity, but I work within people that live in time. I don't change. I don't change. My word isn't going to change. My message isn't going to change. But sometimes I'll change my techniques along the way with the people with whom I work. And sometimes their language will change how they refer to certain things I'm doing. So they used to call it a seer. Now they call it a prophet. And that's okay. And I work with that. Long time ago, they used to call it the scriptures. Now they call it the Bible. I have no problem with that. Now, some critic might. Well, you know, the word Bible's not even in the Bible. Well, that's, I understand that. I, I call the, they call this now the rapture, although I called it a catching away. But that's okay. He's just saying, you see, I'm acknowledging these realities in life. And those of you that pay attention won't be tripped up by some critic that says everything is frozen and locked in a long time ago in a place far away there were some originals locked in there and that's the way it's to be at all times. God says, no, no, I want to show you. I, I, I keep up. I let these people keep up. Just very simple. Now, he, another thing historically, come, let us go to the seer, for he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. From a historical standpoint, what the Lord was doing in Acts chapter 3 and verse 24. Is the Lord was beginning the prophetic office. And that's why when Peter is preaching outside the temple on the day of Pentecost in the afternoon... He says, yea, verse, chapter X, 3.24, yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after. And Samuel was the first of the official prophetic office, what used to be the seer. And so God just letting you know from a historical standpoint. So you saw the practical application, how what used to be called the scriptures is now the Bible. That's fine. You see the historical application. So, so I see a lot of good things here. But now, can I, can I peel back a little more and look a little deeper? And I saw the good outer characteristics of Saul. Can I just scratch a little and show you some points of concern that I have as I look at these verses? Points of concern. They're at a loss. They don't know where to go. Who suggests going to the man of God? The servant and not Saul. Saul didn't know of Samuel. I'm a bit perplexed. Samuel used to live in Ramah. That was his home base. That's where all his reputation had gone forth. Gibeah, which is where Kish and his son live, is 20 miles away. 20 miles away. That's like not as far as from here to Batavia. That's, if you were to walk it at four miles an hour, it'd be a five-hour walk. If you were to ride it on a horse, you'd be there in, depending on how fast the horse is, 20 miles an hour, you'd be there in two hours. Mm -hmm. And he didn't know anything of Samuel. Second thing, I understand the interest of the servant. He's looking for help at the matter at hand. We want to find the asses. Maybe if we go to the, 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 the man of God, he'll give us some help in this arena here. And they're desiring to use the prophet for secular means. No, nobody said her. And, and, and uh, Saul doesn't say, wait a second, we're going to waste a prophet's time with a little thing like a lost donkey? Don't you think the man of God is about the business of God? If we're going to take time to go see the man of God, wouldn't it make more sense to go and listen to what he has to say about the Lord? It's just some things that, that cross my mind. You know, here's Matthew Henry said, most people would rather be told their fortune than their duty and the truth. 
Wouldn't more people rather go to a man of God to find out what's happening in my life, what's my next job going to be, who's the next person I'm going to meet, rather than what the truth is and what my duty is to serve God, rather than how God can serve me? And that's sad. That's troublesome. Saul consents to it, and yeah, we'll just we'll give him well, how much you got in your pocket? Oh, I got the fourth part of a shekel. And really, go back to Exodus chapter thirty. Exodus chapter thirty, and look at verse thirteen. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, When thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, they shall give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord. Verse 13, This shall they give, every one that passeth among them that are numbered, a half a shekel. After the shekel of the sanctuary, a shekel is worth 20 giras. A half a shekel shall be the offering of of the Lord. Verse 15, the rich shall not give more, the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when they make an offering to the Lord. That was not a lot of money. A half a shekel was not a lot. And this guy wants to give a quarter of a shekel, which is half of a half of a shekel. So these boys are going to come in and they're going to tip God. We'll just flip a little something in there, like I would some uh, cheap fortune teller. Maybe maybe they have the wrong notion in their mind what had happened by the time you get to the book of Micah, chapter 3, verse 11. It said the prophets, the false prophets, they divine for money. I mean, the truth of the matter is Samuel neither needed nor wanted their money. Samuel would have been more than happy to give the counsel of God, the counsel of God to these two passers-by. And then the last thing that troubled me just a little bit is the servant offered to pay and Saul offered nothing but an excuse. And it's, I mean, we, we're going to see the man of God. Uh, we don't have anything to bring him. I've got a quarter shekel. Oh, well, fine. As soon as you mention your pocket change, I'm in. Uh, most people prefer a cheap religion, especially on someone else's dime. Th these troubled me. This, this troubles me. I see the outer characteristics, but I'm a little troubled on the heart thing as I'm looking at this a little deeper. We really like it when we can shift the cost of our worship to someone else. You see, David's got a much ad different attitude later on in this book. David will not worship God if it doesn't cost him something. Saul was more than happy to go on someone else's dime. Funny. All right, just, okay, let's go on. Just some thoughts. Verses 11 through 14, we're going to see now Saul's going to make inquiry for the uh, man of God when he gets to town. And as soon as they went up the hill to the city, they found the maidens going out to draw water and said unto them, is, is the seer here? And they, the maidens, answered them and said, well, he is. Behold, he, he's before you. Make haste now, for he came today to the city, for there's a sacrifice of the people today in the high place. As soon as ye be come into the city, ye shall uh, straightway find him before he go up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he come, because he doth bless the sacrifice. And afterwards they eat that be bidden. Now therefore get you up, for about this time ye shall find him. And they went up into the city. And when they were come into the city, behold, Samuel came out against them, for to go up to the high place. And, uh, and here they finally reach this place in, uh, give, in uh, Ramah. And uh, they ask the maidens. And the maidens uh, tell them where it's going out. Reminds me kind of of Proverbs uh, chapter 9 and uh, verse 3. Kind of a portrait of the bride of Christ. And in Proverbs 9 and verse 3, it talks about the maidens that uh, had been sent forth. She sent forth her maidens. They crieth upon the highest places of the city. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that uh, wanted understanding, and she calls them in. And uh, this is, of course, the job of those that are in the custom of serving the Lord at the sacrifice of the Lord, is we're always willing to turn a bystander to the men of God and to the people of God and to the worship of God. 
And that's, that's good practical advice. And we ought to be the same way. But the ark at the same time, as we remember from our last couple chapters, the ark was still in limbo in Abinadab's house back in chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. And Samuel was making use of the altar he built in Ramah back in the 7th chapter, verse 17. And his return was to Ramah, for there was his house, there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar to the Lord. And he would have his sacrifices there while the ark was off there in limbo. In other words, just because I didn't have one peace unnecessary for the worship of God, I'm not going to let that want stop me from worshiping God. I don't need a relic. I don't need an article of furniture. I don't need much more than a heart and an altar to serve and to get close to God. Praise the Lord. And there he is keeping the people close. And so they're having regular sacrifices. They're observing the feasts, and everybody knows this honorable man of God can be counted on when it's time for the sacrifice. And no one would dare eat until he shows up and he bids uh, the blessing of the sacrifice. They showed respect because they understood he was faithful. They knew something was wrong if Samuel didn't show up. Thank the Lord for faithful men of God that show up and do their duty. Well... Verses 15 through 17, in the meantime, the Lord is giving a revelation to his man, the prophet Samuel. Verse 17, now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, tomorrow, about this time, I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because their cry is come unto me. And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold, the man whom I spake to thee of, this same shall reign over my people. The Lord told Samuel, it says in his ear, back in the 15th verse, it was the manner of the Lord in those days aforetime, as it says in diverse manners, to speak by the prophets. And the Lord would speak to his prophets. Uh, Surely God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. That's from the book of Amos, chapter 3, and uh, verse 7. Ten years had passed since the people had asked for a king back in the 8th chapter. And the Lord now is ready to move by providence, and he's chosen this one who has a lot of good outer characteristics that will please the people. Verse 17, uh, the Lord said, Behold, the man whom I spake to thee of! Exclamation mark. What does that mean? Uh, that means what I showed you back in the 8th chapter, verses 10 through 18 those seven characteristics that were inside that the Lord could see. He warned those people. You're asking for this, this is what I'm going to give you. I mean, you ask for something and, and I'll give it to you and it may send leanness to your soul, but I'm going to give you your request. That's why, we, you know, like I said, when we finished that chapter a few weeks ago, we, we better be careful what we pray, and we better sometimes pray that the Lord has the mercy not to answer our prayers. Because we know not what we should ask for. And when we're babies, you know, the Holy Ghost prays for us. When we get a little older, we should pray according to our petitions, according to the will of God. But the Lord now has spoken to his prophet and uh, lets him know, this is the one I spoke to you of, chapter 8, chapter uh, 8. Verses 11, 10 through 18, and this is, this is what he's going to do. So, verse 18, we're going to, and the rest of this chapter, now the prophet's going to receive this young man, Saul. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house is. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. And we're going to receive him first in the gate. Now, it's curious, when Saul meets Samuel, he's utterly clueless as to who he is. And he just walks up and he says, uh, uh, tell me, where's the seer's house? He, he could not recognize Samuel from anyone else walking the streets that day. I mean, here's a great prophet, but he had no attendants around him. He had no fancy robe. 
He had no ensigns of honor. He had no peculiar manner of showing himself different from any other common man. Just like the man on the street. That's the relationship that God wants. And that's the representative God wants. God is not trying to send up or set up a Nicolaitan setup. Matter of fact, Jesus hates the doctrine of Nicolaitans, he says in Revelation. Nicolaitan is where the laity is one group and then the priestly group is another group. And you can tell them by the manner of dress and you can tell them by the way that they, they uh, carry themselves and the attendance they have around them and where they live. And you, you can tell, well, that's where the men of God live. As opposed to going on an ordinary street and having a man of God living in a house next to a guy here who has a regular job and a guy there that's a teacher and someone, and you wouldn't know, you couldn't tell. If he walked down the street and you met him, you wouldn't know he's a man of God from any other common person by the way he dresses. I mean, you know, he dresses like the common man. And that's how the Lord had him to do it. I mean, great worth is hidden under common appearance. This treasure we have inside of us, it's the treasure inside. That's why it's so difficult sometimes. You know, we go door to door and we just look like any common person knocking on a door. We go to pass out a track, we look like any common person. We go to speak, we look at, we are common in our a manner of appearance, but we're extraordinary in the gift that we have inside of us. We have the relationship with God. Let those that have ears to ear hear. And anyone whom God is drawing will begin to acknowledge it. But don't fall into the trap of outward religion that looks outwardly like a whited sepulcher, but inside it's full of dead men's bones. We have life in us. Amen. So, so I mean, Saul is perplexed. He says, the prophet, the prophet is just look like an ordinary man. But I am the seer. And I will tell thee all that is in thine heart. I am the seer. Verse 19. Go up before me to the high place. For ye shall eat with me today. And tomorrow I will let thee go and will tell thee all that is in thine heart. If a man's going to speak the word of God as a prophet, he better be a seer with some insight. Spiritual insight. And uh, that's what we need. And the issue we need to address with people is the issue of the heart. And you're going to find in the end of this chapter, and particularly in the next chapter, Samuel is going to turn this from the mundane issue of the donkeys to the important matter of the heart and the kingdom. And that's how we need to speak, representing God, to people's hearts. The issue is the heart. If they believe in the heart, that's when they get the relationship. Not, uh, how's my next job going to go? Or, or am I going to move to this new state? Or all the things they want us to search the Bible about them. The issue is the heart. And Samuel is going to get to the heart of the issue here. Verse 20, But as for thine asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them, for they are found. Let me quickly address this small concern of you. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Here's the key. End of verse 20. On whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and on all thy father's house? And he quickly moves from the small concern of Saul to the greater concern of the kingdom and the people's desire and the reality that, believe it or not, Saul... You're the people's choice. You are the people's choice. You're, you're tall. You're, you're good looking. You come from a good family. You, you're obedient. You're considerate. You've got all these things. This is, this is just what they're looking for. Someone who's going to be dutiful and stay to the battle, just like you went the extra mile. I mean, all those things that are right in there. That's the people's choice. And God's going to give you the request. Unfortunately, some leanness under their soul because this boy, we're going to find out, has some heart trouble. As we just scratched a little before, 
He really, his primary interest was not the service of God. I don't know how old he is here. Some commentators thought he was close to 40 years old that this event happened in his life. This I do not know. I, I can't get any confirmation as to what uh, age he died at. I know he did rule for 40 years. But um, he's no kid. And, and he's so unfamiliar with God's man, the city of God's man, the services where God's man is. Uh, God's going to give him a chance. We're going to find out it's not going to be his greatest interest. He's going to move from the interest of his own estate and his own inheritance now to the kingdom. And that's where his interest is going to be. It's on outer things and not on the inner relationship of the heart. And that's very sad. So, anyways, uh, verse 21, when he hears this information about the desire of Israel on me, on my father's house, he says, well, am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? My family is the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin. Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? I mean, after all, the, we are the smallest tribe. This, this is not computing. It's not making sense. It, it almost sounds like he has a type of uh, uh, humility here. But I know it isn't so because I can compare it to what Gideon said in Judges 6.15 and to what David says later on in this same book in chapter 18 and verse 18. And in both of those areas, they speak of themselves and the smallest of themselves. Instead, he speaks on the smallest of his tribe. You're going to find this is a problem with him. He has great difficulty dealing with himself, but he has no problem dealing with the people around him. You're going to find this is one of his issues. Folks, the issue isn't what's around you. The issue is you. We're the issue. God's trying to get a hold of us to look in here, to get some spiritual insight in a spiritual mirror here and stop looking out at everyone else. And we'll find more of this as we track through these next few chapters. Anyways, uh, Samuel receives him in the gate, and now he's going to receive him into the... Uh, the, the dining room itself into the parlor there. And uh, verse 22, And Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the parlor and made them sit in the chiefest place among them that were bidden, which were about 30 persons. So, so here he's exalted by Samuel, which is a good thing. Let someone else exalt you. Don't exalt yourself or you'll be abased. Let someone else exalt you. And then Samuel says to the cook, bring the portion which I gave thee, of which I said unto thee, set it by thee. In other words, been told a day before, it's going to be a special day tomorrow. Samuel tells the cook, by the way, when you're cooking the best portions tomorrow of the shoulder and the breast, I want you to set these aside for a special guest. Cook doesn't know, but Samuel does. Verse 24, and the cook took up the shoulder, that which was uh, and that which was upon it, the breast, and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, Behold, that which is left, set it before thee and eat. For unto this time hath it been kept for thee, since I said I have invited the people. So Saul did eat with Samuel that day. So he receives him in the gate, verses 18 through 21. He receives him and exalts him and puts him to a place of prominence. In the parlor, he sets him the shoulder. The shoulder represents strength. Why? Uh, the strength for a king. Why? Because the king bears the government on his shoulder. And the breast represents the place over the heart. That's the place of affection. And the king should be willing to bear the burdens of his people and have a heart for his people. And it's set here. And then finally, the chapter closes after receiving him in the gate and receiving him in the parlor. Then he wants to receive him personally. And verse 25, And when they were come down from the high place into the city, Samuel communed with Saul upon the top of the house privately, and they arose early. And it came to pass about the spring of the day that Samuel called Saul up to the top of the house, saying, Up, that I may send thee away. And Saul arose, and they went out, both of them, he and Samuel, abroad. And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us. And he passed on. And stand thou still a while, that I may show thee the word of God. And now he wants to take some personal time with him and commune with him. And the next chapter, we're going to see the words of God that he begins to relate to this young man as he begins to delve into the matter of the kingdom and the heart 
of God and the heart of this man and what God's going to do with his heart and the privileges that are going to be bestowed upon him through the anointing in the next chapter. But, but we see the dutifulness, the diligence of the prophet. And he receives in a threefold reception in the gate and in the parlor and in the private place of communion, this young man, uh, uh, stand thou still a while. Psalm 46 and uh, verse 10 is one of those great verses. It's probably underlined in your Bible, which says, uh, Be still and know that I am God, and I will be exalted among the heathen. I'll be exalted in the earth. And the only way you can uh, really hear God is in the stillness of hearing his word. And that's what this man wants to do. Stand still that I may show thee the word of God. You know, this is a, for those of you that, that love uh, the Bible. That would be in English, a King James Holy Bible. Yeah, that's a great springboard verse for showing someone the King James Holy Bible. You know, you can't learn which Bible is God if you're on the move, constantly dodging and avoiding the issue and changing the subject and giving every slick Madison Avenue uh, excuse that's been given as to why God's changed the word. You need to be still and receive the fact that that God that saved you was faithful enough to give you his word. That's a great verse to launch off to build a sermon about the word of God. Um, it's right there. It takes some stillness. And by the way, I, I, this is something I've observed on any topic, in any matter, whether it be the scientific arena, the social arena, the political arena, most importantly, the spiritual and the sacred arena. When you're trying to deal with someone, when they have that dodging spirit and they're constantly throwing questions and, not, and they won't be still, they're not going to receive truth in any arena. And I dealt with this for years in the political arena. Sit still for me. Let's discuss this thing. Dodge and bob and weave and change and attack. And I said, You're not interested in hearing truth. And in the scientific arena, in any arena, but sad when it's in the spiritual arena. You're talking about eternity here. And you have to be willing to stand still. And sometimes what we need to do is we need to pray for the people we're talking to that God can help still their spirit for three or four minutes so we can get some truth to them. Because when they're slippery like a snake, you can't get to them. And they're hissing and they're spitting and they're bobbing and weaving and moving like the serpent. Now, next week, we're going to show the words that the prophet has for the young man because the Lord wants to show us some things. This, this has troubled me for years, this, this whole saga of Saul. Has it troubled any of you? I mean, the fact that God chose this man and then what this man did to the office and then the fall, the tragedy of the fall of this man. And I've heard a lot of preaching that... As far as I'm concerned, it misses the mark. It, it doesn't, if it was a bow and arrow shot, it didn't even hit the target. It all just flew off to the side. So, so let me give you, I'm going to give you some thoughts that, that go through my mind. So often, the Lord will set forth in the scriptures and then sample uh, a type, a portrait. And what I see in Saul is a threefold portrait. I see in him because he had so many good initial characteristics that were granted in his favor, obviously by God. I mean, who chose his genes that he would be good looking and tall and intelligent? Who chose his point and place of birth that it would be in a family that all, although we're the least, yeah, there's 600 of us, we're all pretty wealthy around here. We've all got a good size spread. We're all doing fine. I mean, you know, don't give me the false humility. I know there's not many of you, but you got a lot of land, more than the rest of us. I mean, but who chose all those benefits to be given to him? God. And I see a picture. Look at the four letters of his name. There's S-A and there's the letters L-U. Do those sound like the first two letters of anyone else? Let's see, L, yeah, Satan and Lucifer. I mean, who else was given so much at the very beginning? Who else was put in a place of prominence? 
Who else was, I don't know if he was taller than any other angels, but he certainly was made with such a beauty spoken of in Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. Curious portrait, almost a historical, spiritual, eternal past portrait of someone else that was given so much that ended up in a great tra tragic fall because of heart trouble. Another thing I notice about him, to me, he becomes a national picture. And this is one that the Lord showed me years ago in my own Bible reading on types, because as I looked at the progression of the three great kings at the kingdom of heaven era, you've got Saul, and you have David, and you have uh, Solomon. And, and I observed that David's easy, it's a type of Christ. And then the Lord said, well, let's push these back, back and forward. Now, what do you see Solomon as? I said, well, Solomon, let's see, he came from David, and he started out well, and then he too went into a fall, but it's guaranteed in the Bible, in the one Psalm we read, and I forget the number off the top of my head, so let me grab it for you quickly. I believe it is that one Psalm that closes the one Psalter there. Give the king his judgments. And that's the one that guarantees that Solomon is saved. We've studied it before. It's Psalm 72. And it's promised in that one that uh, his name shall endure forever in verse 17. And that's the Psalm for Solomon. And so, so I know that although Solomon fell, he was saved. And then I thought of his name. It means a beloved. It means peace. Um, he had more riches and wisdom than anyone. And I thought of, well, Solomon's a type of the church. So David's a type of Christ that birthed the church. And Solomon started high as a young man, wrote the book of Proverbs with all the wisdom. The wisdom has all, the church has all the wisdom of Christ. By the end of his life, he was an Ecclesiastes, ecclesiastical. The church is now ecclesiastical, living by the world instead of the word, Ecclesiastes. At the end of his life, it's all vanity. If the church is not all vanity today, I don't know what is. It's not very powerful. It's a mess. Last week I was on a program with four other pastors, and I mean basic doctrinal questions. And I would answer them. Can you lose your salvation? Absolutely not. Let me show you from the Bible. Can, uh, will you go to hell if you do not have the Holy Ghost? Well, absolutely if you don't have the Spirit of God, that's where you end up when a soul... I mean, basic doctrinal questions. As soon as I was done answering, all four of them attacked me and con controverted my answers. Well, excuse me, I, I beg your pardon. They're so confused, they don't even know the book anymore. Ecclesiastes, oh my goodness. But what's the last book of Solomon? Song of Solomon, Arise, my beloved, come away. It's the church being raptured. So David's a picture of Christ, and Solomon is a picture of the church. Then what's Saul? What was before David? Israel. Look at the letters. Saul, Israel. They share three of the same letters. S, L, and A. Those are three of the letters you find in Israel. Those are four of the letters of his name. Saul is a picture of the nation Israel. Israel was given prominence by God. It was given a goodly heritage and a goodly inheritance. Israel was head and shoulders above any other nation. Israel started out diligent and obedient, but by the end, Israel fell into a mess. So there's two portraits I see of him. And then the last portrait I see of him is, he's a picture of what will eventually be the Antichrist. Because the Antichrist himself is going to be good-looking, he's going to be intelligent, he's going to be prominent, he's going to be the desire of all the people, and he's going to start out as the friend of Israel and then end up as a mess consulting seances with uh, necromancers and witch doctors and women like the witch at Endor. Sad, but true. So what do we do? Well, we need, we need to spend time with the prophet of God. We need to spend time with the seer and the word of God that he can tell us all what, that's in our heart. Because our hearts are just as deceptive and can end up in the same mess no matter what good outer characteristics we have.
Samuel meets Saul, kind of like Abbott and Costello meet the werewolf or <laughs> Frankenstein, but um, Samuel meets Saul, and the saga will continue. Let's pray. Father, thank you for um, beginning, opening this portrait to us. It's a perplexing portrait, but it's a true portrait, and uh, Lord, we, we wish not it to apply. <laughs> We wish it to be an example to warn us, an example to keep away from. And uh, Lord, we just thank you that uh, you do have honorable, faithful men that are willing to minister the word and help us know what's in our heart and help us to guard our hearts. This I pray in Jesus' name, amen.